Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Quality by Design in Spray Drying Processes, Transfer Lab to Production, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Sune Clint Anderson, Principal Scientist at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, and Jao Vicente, Senior Scientist and Particle Engineering Team Leader at Hovion. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I'll be your moderator. Now please allow me to introduce our presenters. Sune Clint Anderson is a Principal Scientist for Spray Drying at the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. He has a PhD in Chemical Engineering and has worked with pharmaceutical spray drying for 17 years within process development for R&D and commercial scale, application of quality by design and PAT, particle engineering, drying kinetics, aspectic spray drying advantages and disadvantages of spray versus freeze drying processes. He also previously worked at Novo Nordisk for seven years. And our second speaker, Jao Vicente, is currently the leader of the Particle Engineering Group within the Research and Development Department at Hovion Pharma Siena. His research over the last 10 years has been focused on the development of predictive tools and scale-up methods to expedite process development. Before becoming the leader of the Particle Engineering Group, Jao Vicente worked at Hovion as Drug Project Development Scientist and participated in the development and validation of several manufacturing processes of spray-dried products. Dr. Vicente holds a Master's in Biological Engineering and a PhD in Pharmaceutical Technology. I will now be handing over to our presenters. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, welcome everybody to this presentation about quality des by design from, from lab to production. And as uh, Stephen was saying, I'm, uh, my name is Sintan Danderson. I'm going to be presenting the first part here where we will introduce the subject, go through all to the quality by design approach followed by his case study using the quality by design approach. And then we'll switch to Xiao, who will then go into depth about the model-based approach and also with a case study. And then we'll have some final remarks about the application of the quality by design into trade drying. So as the first of introduction, because one of the questions that quite often comes up, is spray drying an art or is it science? and definitely used to in the past be an art uh, where you're designing this large spray dryers on the picture on the left. What you see is a commercial milk spray dryer producing 10 tons of powder per hour. It's a bit out of the league for the pharmaceuticals. And you can see the small white person standing out down there. That's a person indicating the size of the spray dryer. And for that one, of course, in the beginning, it was very much art, but now, luckily, it's becoming more and more science. And that's also some of the elements we will want to show you so you can also basically get an idea about how you apply the science to also both have the smooth particles, as you can see on the small pictures, SEM pictures, and also the more complicated morphologies you can obtain with spray drying. And just to set the scene, so what kind of spray dryers are we talking about? In this case, for the pharmaceutical spray drying, these are the typical spray drying layout, where we first we have the solution preparation on the left, then the solution is pumped to the spray dryer through a pressure nozzle, but it can also be a two-fluid nozzle. In the spray drying chamber, the droplets will dry into particles. Then the particles and the gas will flow to a cyclone, where we separate the largest particles, where we have the main product fraction below the cyclone. Then the finest particles, usually below 2 to 3 micron, will then go to the back filter, where they are separated from, from the gas. Thereafter, the gas and the solvent, which is in the gas the whole time, will actually go to a condenser for environmental reasons. Then we'll condense out uh, all the organic, typically organic solvent we use, all the water. We'll condense it out to be either reused or at least to be uh, basically disposed of in a safe manner. And then we will recycle the drying gas, be it air or nitrogen, to the spray, dryer, uh, spray drying chamber again to be reused. If we sometimes, for especially um, when we use amorphous solid dispersions, then we need to dry the powder a bit further to get rid of the last of the organic solvents. And that, where, that's where you see the secondary drying. So that's typically used for those applications. So this is the system that we'll be talking about for the rest of the presentation. So quality by design, the quality by design approach, a little bit of background about it. Because why was this suddenly seen as needed, something we needed to take a look at and to implement in the pharmaceutical industry? 
And the reasons why this came up was that in the traditional approaches for how we work to ensure product quality and manufacturability, you tested the product, the quality into the product after manufacturing, what you can actually uh, name as quality after design. And we used all, almost always the pharmaceutical industry is conservative, so almost standard manufacturing technologies were used. Then in the beginning of 2000, then the uh, regulatory authorities, especially of course headed by the FDA, said, okay, this, we want this to change. We want basically the pharmaceutical industry to basically take a more scientific approach to do this and all to be more proactive in introducing new technologies. And therefore, they issued the pharmaceutical quality for the 21st century, a risk-based approach in 2004, which in ba basically said that basically was the aim was to introduce modern quality management techniques into the pharmaceutical manufacturing and also encourage early adoption of new manufacturing technology. And this is essentially where quality by design for the pharmaceutical industry started. However, I mean, quality by design, of course, is not as such invented by the pharmaceutical industry. It's actually originates about approximately 10 years before that, where the original concept was introduced by Euron in various publications, and this, uh, where you can basically see it illustrated. And his basically focus was that, a um, point was, sorry, that the, the focus of the quality by design is that quality is built into the product and there's a deep understanding of the product and the processes, both by the, how they're developed, but also how they're manufactured. And then also a key issue is that you know the risk involved in the, manufa in the manufacturing of the product and also how best, best to tackle those uh, risks. So how does the quality by design approach for pharmaceutical product development deviate from the one we see traditionally? And this one, I've taken an excerpt from the ICH Q8 guideline, which illustrates what are the points that we use to where we're based, the two approaches differ from each other. And the first one is that we, I'm sorry. Ah, sorry, I just lost my screen. So the first one, as you see on the top, is that the, um, the first one you see at the top is that basically we use um, basically multiple experiments to basically determine how we actually see the interaction uh, between the different uh, parameters. So we use a multivariate experiment to basically understand the product and the product and basically use that to establish a design space. And that's a basically safe operating region wherein we can basically operate the process and get the desired quality. The second is that we basically also we focus on the control strategy uh, and the robustness of the process. All of this you could say basically boils down to understanding the process and also understanding the product. Now one one the, the yellow uh, the yellow square I've uh, basically indicated is the application of PAT tools. Because while this is definitely something that um, basically enhances the quality by design approach, it's not something you necessarily need in the beginning. Then also key elements is that you base the product performance on the, uh, um, basically you um, base it on the side product performance and also document it with supportive data. And then also that basically for the control strategy, we take a risk-based uh, strategy in order to ma basically control the process, but also that we do understand the risk in producing both the products, but also for the process. And then also a key element in all this, the whole approach is basically that we have the possibility of continuous, continuous improvement. So, what is it that we, uh, shall we say, do in addition, again, just to highlight it a little bit more and just to, to condense it out. And what we do is we have a systematic evaluation and understanding and refining of the formulation and the manufacturing process. And we do that by both ident by identifying which are the material attributes and process parameters that have an, uh, that have an effect 
on the product critical quality attributes and also then by determining what is the relationship between those attributes and process parameters to the, the, to the critical quality attributes. So in essence, using the enhanced product and process understanding in combination with some risk management to really establish uh, the, the whole manufacturing process and an appropriate control strategy, which can include the design space and all real-time release testing. Real-time release testing is definitely the ultimate goal, but it's something that does also take quite a lot of work to achieve. So how do we go about this? And this is a general picture of how to go about a quality by design methodology. And this is one that's uh, been used, I know, for, uh, among other companies like Hovion. And it starts out in the left corner with the product uh, target profile, which tells you something about the quality, the safety, and the efficacy of the product. Based on that, you can use, you can use that one to, de to define your critical quality attributes. And based on that, you can simply make the first assessment of the process parameter, which will be most likely be the most important ones. And we'll have an example of that a bit later to illustrate how does that actually work in, in practice. And also at this point, part, uh, point, you can actually see that this is also a point where you can actually start defining the PAT strategy. Though at this point, it might be a little bit early to basically take a look at it, but it's definitely something that's still doable. Then the next, time, next thing to do after the risk assessment is then to start the process development, doing design of experiments, doing statistical models. And this is an iterative process because this is, of course, if it's a completely unknown, with the, you don't have much knowledge about the, the product, um, then, of course, this might take a couple of iterations going back and forth uh, with the process development before we are able to progress to the next phase where we can say we have a design space. After then the design, the, the defining the defined space and the normal operating ranges, then we go on to a more, you could say, rigorous risk assessment of the whole um, the whole process and the product, so that's the FMEA, FMEA. And then when we go from the risk assessment, then we can start looking at the criticality, which parameters are critical, which ones are key, which ones are non-critical, which because this will give us input to our process control strategy. And then we also, at that point, also in parallel, we also do the implementation of the PAT, depending on which one was critical and which one were not. And when we have done all this, then we're basically ready to make the implementation of the whole process, and then we also then we can go to regulatory filing and approval. So linking the process, the material, sorry, the material attributes and process parameters to the product CQA. This is one of the key issues in the quality by design approach, and if we have if we're using the traditional approach, then the material specification, the process parameter ranges are primarily based on batch process history and also univariate experiments. It doesn't tell you anything if there's any interaction between the different uh, both the material properties and also the process parameters. When we're using the enhanced approach of the quality by design, then basically what we will do is then we'll take a look at what are the potential sources of the process variability. Is it the raw material? Does it vary if we change the batches of the raw material used? Does it impact the attributes of the product? Then we will also aim at identifying the material attributes and the process parameters that have the greatest impact on the product quality. And this can be based on prior knowledge, or it can be also be a specific risk assessment done for the specific product. Then, based on this, we will design and conduct studies that enable us to identify and confirm if there are links, and also if there are links, what are the exact relationship between the material attributes and the process parameters. For example, verifying that this one is indeed, this has the highest impact on the critical quality attributes of the product. Based on the, the, those data, we can uh, analyze, yeah, we'll analyze those data, and then we can establish appropriate ranges for our design space for our all our uh, operating parameters. So for spray drying, we know 
freight running has been known for many years, so there's quite a, of course quite a lot of prior knowledge about freight running and also an understanding of what how, how it actually uh, the different process parameters will impact or has potential to impact the different critical quality attributes. So in order to have the process understanding, we need to have an idea about the impact of the parameters on the, those attributes. And then we also need to know a bit about what is the, if there's any interaction between the process parameters and for, for in this case through the design of experiments. And typical critical quality attributes for the spray drying process, a uh, little bit of course dependent whether it's a biopharmaceutical or it's a small molecule, but purity of course, high molecular weight protein for biopharmaceuticals, solvent content, be it organic or be it water, is important for of course all the products. Particle size of course is something that's very, very relevant for spray drying, one of the key, key reasons why we do it. And as indicated here, this is one of the more uh, tricky ones because this is something that typically changes during scale up, because when we go from the small lab scale spray dryers to going to the production scale spray dryers, then we typically go up in size, not only because we can, but also because the larger particles are usually easier to handle, uh, especially if you want to do a tableting process. But of course, if you have an inhalation product, then of course you want to stay with the particle size. Powder density also changes flowability, particle shape, quite important if it's inhalation. Crystallinity, of course, a key issue if you're working with amorphous solid dispersion. You definitely want that one. That's definitely a critical quality attribute. And then the last one indicated the yield. It's not as such, it's not as such critical for the quality, but it is a key process quality attribute. And if that one is varying too much, of course, then you have definitely also have issues with the process. Then your process is probably most likely not robust enough. So how do the different uh, process parameters in spray drying impact in, in, overall, in general the critical quality attributes of the product? In the atomization, it's a key event in spray drying because it determines primarily the particle size but also the solvent content. Large particles usually tend to have higher solvent contents than smaller ones. So atomization is really a key. So there's the different parameters which are dependent on the atomizer design. If it's a pressure nozzle, then definitely the pressure, uh, and you could say the liquid flow, uh, pressure slash liquid flow rate is a key uh, parameter. If it's a two fluid nozzle, which is typically used for the inhalation products, then the liquid and some atomization gas flow rate is the uh, key parameters. Then the droplet gas contact is, says something about how the, uh, basically the, uh, how well the droplets are dispersed initially, and that's uh, very important for both the morphology and the density because basically it impacts how fast the droplets will dry. So that's the drying gas flow rate. It's usually fixed uh, at a constant value to get maximum capacity, but also the gas dispersal design in a spray dry is quite important in this one in order to determine uh, the drying kinetics uh, or the initial uh, droplet gas contact. Then the third one, the third event, which basically takes place in most of the chamber in the spray dryer, is the drying itself, and that will impact the solvent content. The larger the drying chamber is, the longer the residence time, then you usually will have lower solvent content. Activity and purity and high molecular weight proteins related to that basically, that's also, since the particle spends quite a lot of, a product spends quite a lot of time there, it also means that's the biggest, where we have the biggest risk of the degradation. Also, the glass transition temperature and natural being linked to the solvent content is also something that's impacted usually through that part. Then last but not least, the collection, and that uh, might seem a bit uh, uh, funny, and that impacts the solvent content, but then also the activity, the purity, the high molecular weight protein of the compound. And this is especially if you change between either cyclone collection or backfilter collection. If it's cyclone collection, then residence time is quite small. It's usually less than one minute in the spray dryer. But if you collect your particles using a bag filter, then the particles will usually stay on the filter bags for somewhere between five to 15 minutes. And then you definitely have a different profile with respect to the solvent content and potentially also the activity of the product. So, then to, as I said, mentioned earlier, one of the main points in the quality by design approach is the design of experiments because this is really where you, find, you get all of them, basically most of the knowledge about your spray drying process and also the interaction between the different parameters. 
So this is really a key issue, how you set up the design of experiments. So in this case, it's basically split in seven steps, and we'll just go through each of them, except step five, carry out the experiments. We cannot do that uh, right here in the presentation, of course. The first one, define the targets and goals. Uh, is it screening? Do we know something about the process? Is it characterization of the process? Or is it optimization? Uh, step two, define which parameters are we going to look at? What are we going to measure? Uh, are we going to use PAT? Then, they, then we choose the experimental design. How do we want to set it up? Then assess the size and practicality of the experimental design. This is quite a key issue because you might want to do as much as possible to get as much information out of po as possible, but that might also give you an unreasonable number of experiments. Then we do the results, but then afterwards, of course, also important is to analyze the results to make a model of the results, and then also do the model validation to see if it, it, it works. And then also, if needed, perform a confirmatory experiment, because as mentioned earlier, it's quite unusual that we finish it just one round. So the first part to do with, this, with defining the targets and the goal of the process. This can be done in various ways, but usually you can see there's different DOE types here, and it depends on also the number of parameters uh, you have uh, in, in your, basically in your process uh, idea that you need to investigate. The more you have, the more experience it uh, requires, uh, and of course also then you need to think a little bit about how you design the experiment. Here listed different design of experiments types, and also if we look at the ones that, there's one with the range finding, we usually don't use that one too often. We usually go to the screening exploration where we have, in the beginning, a huge number of factors, and then we do a, what's known as a two-level fractional factorial in order to basically find out which parameters are important. Then for the characterization, quantification, then we have a smaller number of parameters, and we use, uh, we use still a little bit of the same design, but then we start to look really more for the interaction between the parameters. And then for the optimization and for the design for robustness, then you have lower number of parameters, then you go to different designs in order to get the maximum knowledge out of the, uh, the design of experiment. And you can see in the last row there, you can see what is it that you really are looking for in those design of experiments. And for example, for the, as you can say, in the screening, then it's really the main effects and just to reduce it. And then you start to look for two-way interactions and then you start to look for even more detailed information about the process. Then defining inputs and also with uh, responses, but also and also the use of PAT. And this is of course also a quite critical step. And one of the most important one is basically what, what is the most important factors based on the prior knowledge, because usually there will always be some knowledge about the process. But also one thing to keep in mind here is that basically there will always be limitations to the historical data because some operating conditions were not measured and some of them there was not enough variation and some of them basically some of the parameters was known as confounded basically then they interacted with each other and basically then they basically hide some of the effects. Also another one is to check whether is the factor that you would like to change, is it open to variation, is it easy or hard to change. I just mentioned, for example, the gas disperser on a production scale unit, changing the gas disperser, really not an option, so that one will just be fixed. Is it easier, difficult to control? Is it something that where basically turns out that basically it's indirectly controlled? Can we measure it at all? And also, is it something that's quantitative, or can we, is it just on or off? Heating, for example, of a collection container that's on or off, for example, or, uh, sometimes it can be on or off, can also be controlled but that's also to figure out what is the capabilities of the systems. Also always list the factors which are kept constant. It's always nice to have the list of it that it knows that it was taken into consideration. And then also for the input levels, basically always consider that you get sufficient variations in the response level in order to learn something about it. If you only vary the temperature by, by a couple of degrees, most likely you will not get something that's meaningful because then it all, all shows the same. So experimental design, which design to choose? 
And this also depends on the number of factors you have. What you see, the one listed in green, is where you get maximum number of information. Red, you get limited number, and yellow, yeah, such in, so uh, basically in between. And of course, it seems nice to choose, of course, only the green one. And as you can see, if you have few parameters to investigate, then it's not too bad with the experiments. But as you can see, when you start to go something like five or six parameters, then you're talking about 32 to 64 experiments. And this is, I should say, this is only doing them one time. And basically, most people, you would prefer to do it at least to replicate the results uh, just in order to see especially if it looks strange, in order to verify if it really is that effect you're looking at. And mentioned in the table below, you can see if you have a resolution 5 or a full uh, resolution 5, then you can really see quite a lot about the interaction between, you can see, four-way interactions or higher. Uh, so definitely, that's a, for the main effects, that works really, really well. And as you can see, full factorial, of course, is the ideal, but again, limitations on the number of experiments. And this is, brings me to the point about assessing the size and the practicality of the design, because this is really sometimes where we see, sometimes especially in the academic literature, where people have performed 240 experiments in order to do it. And it's really, really nice work, no doubt about it. But I think also most people realize if you go out in industry, there's no way there's time or API to do 240 experiments. One thing, though, is always is also the center points. Uh, they're necessary to determine the curvature, which means also it, whether it's a nonlinear interaction between the parameters. But also the center points is usually where we have our normal operating points. So that one, you really want to have at least a triplicate, if not more, experiments in order to determine what its kind of variations I'm looking at when we have our normal op operating point. We also need the replicates in order to estimate the error. And then one thing this mentioned here in point four, the blocking. And that sometimes we have effects. They might affect the results, but they're essentially not of, our, uh, of primary interest. And as examples mentioned, same equipment. If you have two straight dryers and the same size, then it be be, might be nice to basically try experiments of both of them, because while they have maybe from the same supplier, they might still probably uh, be a bit different. And that, then the the recommendation is block what you can, randomize what you cannot. And then one thing we've added specifically here is remember to include cleaning between the batches. Because one of the things is people sometimes think, oh, I'll just do 20 experiments in a row, and then I'm done with all the experiments. The problem here is that sometimes what happens if the yield of one of the operating conditions is only 40%? means that you have 60% left somewhere within the spray dryer. And you don't know if that's going to be affecting the next one. And that means then you need to have some cleaning in between. So always timing-wise, you need to account for something like this. So after doing the results, then the next thing is, to, of course, then to analyze them and then check the reproducibility. Did we see variation as we expected? Was it too, too little or was it too much? And um, then we need to go for the selection, the model, and then we need to basically, when we build the model, you can do two approaches. You can start from a complex model and then simplify it, or you can go build simple and then you can add terms. And my recommendation would be to start simple and then to start add, adding terms, because using a model where you have four-way interaction between, uh, between the parameters usually doesn't, uh, get, usually don't gain that much from that one. Then there's also to validate the model, and it would be nice to be able to test it uh, on a different set of experiments. Also be a, a good exercise simply to have the validation. And this is an example that I just brought forward, because sometimes it's also to assess whether uh, yeah, it makes scientific sense, the model you came up with. And this is taken from an article, article published last year, where they did a spray drying. And they came up with an equation relating the water content to only the drying gas flow rate. And this is a bit interesting as a spray drying process, and there's no effect of temperature. So you could apparently, based on this equation, choose any temperature you like. This, of course, does not make a lot of scientific sense from the dry, uh, spray drying process, because, of course, the temperature would be having a huge effect on the water content. So that's something definitely to check 
before you have finalized the model. In the end, based on all these experiments, we should end up with a design space in the end. And the design space of a spray drying process is the yeah, multidimensional combination of an interaction of input variables, which give us the process parameters that have been demonstrated to provide assurance of the quality. That's the official definition of it. Definitely, this is our the space where we can operate the process in and get the right quality. And this is, you could say, the ultimate goal of the DOE exercise is to identify this design space. <coughs> now, to move on to a case study to illustrate some of these principles from the um, part of applying the design of experiments. So, the situation was that we had a process of an excipient where it was quite simple, solution preparation followed by spray drying. It was quite an expensive excipient. There was problems with build off deposits in the spray dryer. You could only run for eight to 10 hours before you had to shut it down and clean it. And the critical process parameters were not well understood. <coughs> so what we set about to do was to identify the critical process parameters and the corresponding critical quality attributes, in this case defined as a power density in the water content, to establish a design space and then to maximize yield and production capacity and then to try to basically apply PAT and modeling to get a better control of the process. So first thing we did was we looked at the quality target product profile to say, okay, what is it that really is important for this uh, product, for this excipient? And now, yeah, it should have said excipient particle size. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's for the drug product. So drug particle size is important, excipient particle size, the purity of the excipient, residual solvents, but also my microbiology uh, for this case. Yeah, and I should say the dosage form was a tablet. So critical quality attributes based on this target product profile was water content, particle size, density, and then the purity of the compound. So what we did is then we moved on to the risk assessment in order to estimate which were the most important uh, critical uh, or potential critical process parameters for this uh, spray drying process. And this can be done in different ways with the risk assessment. And this is not in scope, but uh, in this case, what was done here was that this was carried out actually at Hopion. And what uh, we did was that three different spray drying experts was asked to say, rank the different parameters ranked here in the table uh, from one to five, with five being the most important ones. And they were done, they, they did that independently. And then the average of the scores were taken and then the highest scores uh, were basically looked at and those were the parameters selected uh, to go further for the first round of uh, the design of experiments. And in this case, not a huge surprise, the outlet temperature was selected as one of the parameters the atomization pressure, and then the pressure nozzle, sorry, orifice core was selected as the third parameter. An outlet temperature and atomization is the quite normal parameters to be selected as they determine the solvent content, but also determines both capacity, atomization pressure, capacity, but also the particle size. One thing to mention here is that the, func uh, the outlet temperature is a little bit special because there's no, you could say, a handle on the spray dryer where you can basically directly turn and the outlet temperature changes directly. It's a function of the inlet temperature, the solution flow rate, and the drying gas flow rate, and of course the solution properties. So in order to change the outlet temperature, you will have to change one of those three parameters. So the first uh, round of this design, spray drying design of experiments we chose a central composite face center design, as you can see illustrated here in the figure. And now comes this one of those parts of the randomization. We actually we chose actually to do the, the design of experiments on a production scale spray dryer. This spray dryer is about 10 to 12 meters tall, uh, quite large volume spray flow rates around uh, somewhere between 50 to 80 kgs per hour of solution. And this also means we could not do a complete randomization uh, of all the experiments. For example, if you have, when you had to change the nozzle, you could, I mean, it would take two to three hours, uh, or not the nozzle, but it, was, it would take, take 
about an hour perhaps before it, the sprayer would cool down sufficiently in order to change the nozzle and of course that was, was not doable. But then the three, three nozzles, HC, ABC, three atomization pressures of 25 to 40 bars, and then three outlet temperatures from 80 to 95 degrees. So this is just a picture we basically took also just to verify do we, were we getting, what were we getting out morphology-wise, and we were getting what we expected, fairly, fairly nice round particles, of course not perfect, but still in line with what we have seen from the product produced before. So what did we get out more, more uh, exactly from the data? And what was the, the basically this is the interaction between uh, the parameters and basically the main effects. And what we saw was not surprisingly the water content correlated directly with the outlet temperature. The higher the outlet temperature, the lower the water content. This is basically what we would expect also from a scientific physically point. Then there's a small effect of the pressure uh, on the water content also not unusual, but also not the, basically not, not, not a huge effect compared to the uh, outlet temperature. The nozzle interpretation is a bit, uh, basically, you could say difficult to interpret because also usually we would not interpret on the nozzle itself, but we more interpret then on the outlet temperature. But a slight effect there, but not a huge one. For the density, we did see no effect of the nozzle, but definitely an effect of the outlet temperature. This is also something that is uh, quite expected. The higher the outlet temperature, the more you would expect the particle to balloon. So basically, you would expect a lower density with a higher outlet temperature. So this is to summarize essentially what I said was that, uh, yeah, the same, the basic water content primarily by the outlet temperature and tap density, outlet temperature, but also the atomization pressure where we also did see a little effect. So what we did after this, after building uh, this process where we said, okay, let's let's do a validation now. So let's then we ran two batches of uh, 400 kg each and for tw um, the process took 24 hours. And what you see here is the two charts uh, showing how the process performed uh, during the 24 hours. And as we can see, they actually performed quite nicely. We can see basically, the, you can see there's a model prediction and then there's a really experimental result from the batch around it. And actually it was uh, actually a quite fair match um, from the model and then also from the two validation batches here. And as you can see, we actually ended up with a yield of 99% and we were able to run the process of 24 hours. So that was a, actually something that was a quite good result of this exercise. Now, then we actually had to move on to the second round of design of experiments because one of the things, if somebody noticed, was that we are actually operating at one of the corners. So we are operating at 40 bars and also at 95 degrees. So we were actually at the corner of the design space. So this is a quite uh, not unusual issue, and that means then if you're operating in the corner, you don't know what happens if you go outside the corner. So therefore, of course, we had to expand the design space in the second uh, round in order to get that knowledge. What we then also did was we then we also included the temperature of the condenser in order to get an idea about if this would impact the spray drying process. And I'll just jump directly to the results and actually what we saw when we extended the um, the process ranges was essentially we saw a bit of the same behavior, but we did also see some differences which we ascribe to the material properties, and we'll get back to that a little bit later, because we were seeing some different water contents now still within the range we expected, but we are still seeing not quite the same results as we saw uh, based on the DOE1. But the dependency on the temperatures and parameters was the same. So in the third one, as I said, we did suspect that there was something within solution preparation and the material properties that basically also affected the water content. So we did in uh, the third round, we took a look at the solution uh, pH and the solution temperature, how, if that could affect the water content and the powder density. So this is the third round of the experiment. And yeah, I should say low pH, uh, normal pH, set point pH, and then high pH. 
And these are actually the result is that we did see quite a significant effect of the pH. And while we were perhaps not surprised about this effect, we were surprised a bit about the extent of the effect, which was a bit larger than we actually expected. And I can say the conclusion of this um, yeah, you can also see that if we are moved lower in the PA to PA is minus 0.7, then you can say we had actually quite a huge operating space. And then if we went upwards in the pH, you would see then we have a much smaller design space to operate in. So this actually was one of the, uh, uh, made us basically revise the control strategy for the solution preparation in order to control the pH in a much more narrow range and investigate whether we could move a little bit away from the current set point because we simply said, okay, this is really, yeah, we can probably operate it, but it's quite close. And so, yeah, just to, to round this one off, does it pay off for the quality by design versus the more traditional approach? And definitely the process developed by quality by design does in general show a higher yield not much, a little bit, so, but that's not the main advantage. But the, the one comes in the second row where you see that the quality, the number of batches you run without a deviation, it's much higher simply. So basically you have a much better control of your process. And this is actually also reflected in the fact that you do continuous improvement in the third row. You do that much more often, and that's simply because you have the ability to see a lot more what's going on in the process, and you also understand the process a lot better. So therefore, continuous improvement is much faster. And then third, basically, but also, is it more expensive? Yes. If you do a quality by design uh, pro uh, approach in the beginning, it does cost you more API. It does cost you more excipients. It takes more time on the spray dryer. So definitely, it is more expensive to, impl uh, to impl implement in the beginning. But when you reach a certain number of batches, be it 10 or be it 20, then definitely you will see the payoff, and then you will have the return of your investment in the quality by design approach. So it's definitely worth uh, worthwhile to do at a certain stage in spray drying process development. And with that, I will give the word to Xuao, who will then talk about the model-based approach. So hello, hello everyone in the audience, uh, and and thanks, and thanks, thanks for this for this uh, this explanation. Great, great and thorough explanation on the KBD approach. Actually, I think I, I will pick on, on your last slide to introduce the, the second part of this webinar. Uh, but first, let me introduce the, the, the company. So, uh, Ovion is a, is a contract manufacturing organization that provides pre-drying services uh, from the early stage of process development up to the process performance qualification, of course, and also do, uh, for, for commercial manufacturing. Um, I have been, have been working in the company for, for 10 e e years. Um, always in the, in the spreading technology, and I, I must say that this this uh, approach that that soon uh, just just presented is pretty much aligned to, with uh, the quality by design approach that I am used to. Uh, the benefits I, I think are clear for me are clear. Uh, I think are clear for everyone. Um, however, however, and picking on on the last slide, um, the the main drawback is the, the initial investment in, in the early stage. So as soon just mentioned. Uh, we we need to be able to invest significantly in the early stage of the program in develop and developing a process at large scale, and this may not be feasible for for fast track drugs or or for small medium biotechs. Uh, and for, for example, in, in in the first QBD submission that I have participated, uh, we run approximately or more more than 250 uh, tests at scale, and, and this again. In some cases, or in most of the, on the cases, may not be practical or, or, or even feasible, and, and this is a driver for for the scientific research that that or my scientific research in, in the last years is is one goal. So minimize the resources uh, resources required for for process development. So the 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 goal the goal of this model based uh, approach that that I will present is to leverage on prior knowledge on first principle modeling tools and on lab data to, to build a, a reliable design space that can be projected uh, at any manufacturing scale without or without or with reduced or ideally non large scale verification. So in the first part we have we have 
watch soon soon on a on an experimental based approach i'll try to 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 provide or to deliver a different tone on a more model based approach based on the quality by design principle so starting by the physical principles i i think i will skip this this slide so to so introduce the physical principles Atomization is definitely key, uh, where the, 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 the liquid feed is fed to, pumped to, to a nozzle. So this is one of the aspects on the scientific points that we need to address. How to uh, adjust nozzle design and feed properties and feed flow rate to, to the target droplet size. And then the drying kinetics, the drying of the droplets to particles. Um, the, the messages that, that I have, that I want to deliver in this slide are, are, are pretty much what, what what you see on the, the two figures on the bottom, so the, the TFD simulation uh, that you see there, so demonstrates that the, the drying gas inside the drying chamber is most, mostly uh, at the exhaust condition, being temperature, being relative saturation and, and humidity. And, and this may be relevant for, for, for the, the upcoming slides regarding modeling. So I, we consider that the main phenomena occur predominantly at exhaust conditions. Regarding product temperature, what, what you see on the slide on, is, is the, the red line. Uh, there's an initial period where, where the droplet is up, up to, to the wet bowl while, while there's no evaporation. Then after the onset of evaporation, the temperature of the product remains unchanged on the wet bowl temperature. Uh, and that persists while there's solvent at the surface of the droplet. Uh, and then when, when starts the particle formation, there's an additional resistance to evaporation and the temperature rises up to the outlet temperature. So these are the, the messages on the physical principles of the spray drying that I want to deliver here. Then in terms of modeling tools that will be useful for the scale up, I divided, I selected three, three important uh, models. Uh, one is the thermodynamics. So in its essence, it is a uh, heat and mass balance and uh, equilibrium equations that will provide the, the relationship between, between the different variables. So for example, with this balance mass balances and heat, heat and mass balances, we are able to predict what would be the outlet temperature for a given gas flow rate and for a given inlet temperature and feed flow rate. Uh, this quantitative relationship will be key for, for, for the, the, the development and for the scale up. Then another point uh, are the, the, the determination of, of psychrometric charts that, that are not measurable. And two of them are, are illustrated in, in, the, in the slide. So it's the relative saturation and the dew point. This for, from a manufacturing point of view, uh, it, it, uh, there are two key indicators. Uh, and of course, this, this is a, a model, a very accurate model. So any offset on, 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 on this model may mean that we have an abnormal uh, operation. Uh, so this is can, can also uh, work as, as a, tr a troubleshoot and identification of abnormal conditions. The second model is the control of the, of the spray characteristics. So it's, the, it's uh, a model that the outcome is a droplet size as a function of liquid properties, nozzle design, and feed flow rates. And the third, the third model that, that I want to highlight is the drying kinetics, so the determination of evaporation rate that will affect morphology and density and other, other variables that I, I, will, I will show in the next slides. So the thermodynamic model, I think I covered most of it. So it's a heat and mass balances, liquids, and the key here is the liquid and vapor equilibrium in, in the condenser. So with the liquid vapor equations, we can determine the inlet composition of the drying gas and then uh, close the, the mass balance uh, and establish the quantitative relationships that, that I have mentioned. One point is this is a very accurate model. So we expect high, high degree of predictability uh, in terms of, of this relationship between variables. Then regarding the optimization model, there are many reliable models published in the literature that relates the, the nozzle design with, with, with the droplet size. Uh, there are many types of nozzles, many, many equations. Uh, the, the outcome 
of size, as I mentioned before, is droplet size as function uh, of fit flow rate and solution properties. The usefulness, the usefulness of, of this model is what you see on the, on the figure on the right, that is to select the nozzle that fulfills either the criteria or both criteria of particle size and fit flow rate established for a given manufacturing process. Regarding the drying kinetics, uh, the drying kinetics is, is highly correlated with, with morphology and density. Uh, general trend is the, the, the faster the drying, the, the lower the density and the spherical the particles. Uh, on the other hand, the slow drying promotes shrink, shriveled and shrink particles with high density. Uh, other, other important parameter that can be calculated uh, from the drying kinetics models, it, it, it's the, the evaporation rate that will dictate the maximum droplet size that can be dry in a given scale. And this is very important to, to establish a boundary uh, in terms of, of maximum droplet size uh, for a given solvent at any scale. And then the scales. Um, so it's, it's common throughout the clinical program that the, the requirement in, ter in terms of, of spray dried material increases as the, the, the program advances in scale. Uh, so in the early stage, you may need 100 grams or so, and that, that can be manufactured in the, the, the laboratory or pilot scale. But throughout the, the clinical pro program, uh, multiple scale ups may, may be needed to, to supply the, the, the program. And then the, the main question is how to develop the process in each individual scale, minimizing the, the experiments needed, the resources time, minimizing the, the API, the available API required to develop the process. And this is the main question that I, I want to address with this, with this methodology that I am presenting. So as I said, this is QBD-based approach, so most of the steps that soon presented in, in the first part apply in this methodology. Uh, so the risk, the risk assessment, so what are the steps that affect the, the quality attributes? I will skip this, this was explained in detail uh, in the first part. Um, this, uh, this second risk assessment is also explained, but I want to add another layer. So. In order to project one design space in other scale or in, in, to project the design space at any scale, we need to quantify the, the relationship between CQAs with scale independent parameters. Uh, so that, that is the green layer that you see on the screen. Um, so and, and ideally, if this correlation is determined in the lab, we'll be able to, based on scale independent parameters, establish a design space to quantify and control the critical quality attributes. The one that you see there, and I have mentioned density, highly correlated to drying kinetics, particle size with droplet size, crystallinity with drying kinetics, and formulation, of course, and SAN and degradance uh, with, with temperature and hold time. So what change across scales? When, what, the, 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 the theory of the terrain is the same, uh, what the main change is the size. Uh, and, and consequently, hold the possible hold times, either in solution, either the wet STD material, uh, may, may increase these hold times, and that uh, needs to be studied uh, before, uh, the, before going for, for manufacturing. Um, so in this slide, I, and I soon, soon, soon already mentioned this, uh, the, these two limitations. So the, these limitations are on one hand, when you scale up, um, the energy required to optimize the, the liquid into fine droplets, it, it, it will be very demanding. So to some point impossible to, to add larger scales, uh, manufacturing particles of, of a very low uh, particle size. Uh, one of the, of course, there are solutions, and one of the solutions uh, is to to multiply the nozzles inside the drying chamber. This may be the case, for example, for, for inhalation products where the, the particle size requirements are on the lower hand. Uh, other other limitation that we have 
uh, is on the on the small on the small scale. Uh, so to to in, to dry larger larger droplets, let's say 80, 100 microns in the lab may not be feasible. So the residence time of the lab equipment may not allow time enough to dry such a large droplets. Uh, and the same applies to density. So w w what you see in the figure was a, 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 a tailor made a homemade uh, spray dryer with an extended chamber exactly to provide to provide samples of material representative of the large scale. So this unit was built to maximize the overlap in terms of physical properties um, between the lab and the industrial scales. So apart from these limitations, uh, I, I, the, the methodology that that uh, that you see now on the screen, it's a clear the the, the name, the three mark, this development by design. It's a clear analogy uh, to quality by design. And it's briefly explained, uh, illustrated in, in, in the diagram. Um, so it, it you try to leverage prior knowledge. So all all the, the all the, the batches and products that were manufactured at Alfion, um, we we can extract useful information from 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 those programs and apply to a new one. And this is the essence of of the first step that I will explain in more detail in, in the upcoming slides. Then design space studies. The goal here is to verify or develop, build a design spacing with laboratorial uh, experiments. And then for clinical manufacturing, project that design space into the, the clinical, uh, into the, the, the scale that is required for a, a given uh, clinical phase. And, and then when close, close to the, the, the process validation uh, is when it's time to invest, to invest uh, uh, on, on resources, so close to the process performance qualification is where it's worth to 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 invest in, in experiments to verify the design space. So essentially, th this is the main the main goal of this development by design initiative. The case study or the illustrative example that I, I bring here today uh, is a, a fast a fast track uh, program. So, and follows the, the, the steps that, that, that I have mentioned. So, laboratory studies to define the design space, stability data to support the manufacturing, scale up straight under, under GMP for, for clinical supply. Uh, registration can be done at, at any scale uh, without large scale testing, and then scale up again under GMP for the, the commercial scale without large scale testing, and close to the validation, we, 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 we recommend uh, uh, a, de a design space verification prior to, to the PPT. The formulation, what in this case, in this illustrative example, is a PVPVA, ethanol, it's a drug load of 30%. What I, I meant for this formulation here is, is to say that it's very aligned with our prior knowledge and thus I will be able to leverage all the data gathered from, from the last 10 years of experience with spray drying. And here, here you have the, the database, so enriched with more than 1,500 R&D batches, so different conditions uh, that, that would be supporting the, the, the design space. So in this, this first step, leverage the prior knowledge. So of course, the, every equipment has a specification ranges. Uh, within it, we have a qualified operational ranges, so a subregion of the specification, uh, and then we can impose additional boundaries. For example, based on theoretical considerations is the second point that, that you have on the slide. Uh, for example, the, the dew point, the dew point of, of the drying gas has to be below room temperature to avoid condensation. The jacket temperature of the secondary drying step and the outlet temperature of the, of the spray drying has to be below glass transition temperature to assure the physical stability of the material and maximize yield. And I've also uh, mentioned the, the maximum droplet size that is determined based on evaporation rate. So with these theoretical considerations, we narrow down the manufacturing, the feasible manufacturing space uh, for, at any scale. So this is scale independent, depends only on the solvents. And then with that 1,500 batches, we can derive multivariate models uh, to quantify the relationship between particle size and scale independent parameters, both density with scale independent parameters and absorption models. 
This absorption model will, will dictate the glass position temperature uh, of the material at any scale. So this, actually, without a single experiment, we can provide, based on this database, a design space uh, without uh, a single ex experimental experiment. Then, on the laboratory, we can we can refine or verify or build a new a new model um, based uh, based on product specific data. So, and the main goals uh, on the on the laboratory, of course, you can assess rheology, familiarity, solution preparation, assess yield, find the edge of failure. But the key points are the scale independent correlations and the stability studies. Uh, for the, the scale independent correlations, I, I have individual slides to, to, to detail that. For the stability studies, what is important is to assure that during solution all time, there's no degradation, that during spray drying, no degradation on crystallinity, and during wet holes, so the, the, the wet material, there's no degradation and and so essentially, is to assure that for different thermal exposures and environment conditions, uh, the integrity, physical and chemical, of the material is assured. And in the lab, that can be done at a, a worst case scenario in terms of exposure and temperatures. Then the skill independent correlations. You have on the screen the plasticization and drying curve. That essentially is a product, product dependent. Uh, but scale independent correlation, so the glass transition temperature as function of the residual solvents. With this, we be as this is scale independent, uh, we'll be able to transpose this across scales. The other two scale independent correlations uh, are seen in, in these two figures. So one is droplet with particle size can be extrapolated to commercial scales, and the bulk density with its mass transfer ratio. So this is a drying kinetic parameter that can also be correlated with density. So with all this information from stabilities and scale independent, we can theoretically, or based on lab data and physical and, and, and theoretical models, build the boundaries of the design space that can be generated theoretically and projected to, to, any, to any manufacturing scale. And this was done only with prior knowledge, lab laboratory data, uh, and, skill and first principle skill independent models. I, I had a slide for the secondary drying step, uh, but the, 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 it's the same. The, the, back, the, back, the, the backbone of, of the methodology for that, the secondary drying step that is similar to the spread line, so it's based on the on the the the, the plasticization curve. So the methodology, according to this methodology, what you need to assure is that the drying the the, the drying temperature is below the glass transition temperature to assure that no recrystallization may occur occur do, during the the drying. Then this is a process that is mostly controlled by 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 the in process control strategy. So by sampling and assessing and, and analyzing the, the residual solvents contents. When, when the drying takes a long time, what may be implemented is what you see on the right figure. That is a stepwise approach. Um, that means increased temperature as the drying proceeds. This means that as the drying proceeds, the, the, there's the reduction of the solvents of the solvents in the material, increase of the Tg, and thus the, the, drying, the drying temperature can be increased without compromising the, the integrity of the material. And then, last step is the large-scale verification. So on one hand, we, we, with the prior knowledge, we have established a design space for different pro products for different scales. So it it's relies on multivariate data analysis, theoretical considerations, and first principle models. So on, on one hand, we have this, this model built with different products, different scales. On the other hand, we have a model for product-specific data built on the lab. 
these two design space can compete with, it, with each other or, or can overlap. And this can be used as, as an assessment of the, of the uncertainty of the design space. Ultimately, if these two, two models match and provide the same manufacturing conditions for a given manufacturing process, we can support uh, or we, we can support the manufacturing conditions based, based on the confidence of, of these two, two models. Of course, experimental verification, this is the ultimate goal to, to, to be able to project with high confidence the, the, the design space at the lab to any commercial scale. But more conservative approach uh, may be used uh, and demonstrate at large scale that the, the, the critical process parameters, uh, the, the relationship between the critical process parameters and verify, verify at large scale prior to the PPQ that the, the, the design space still applies for, for this product. And, that, and the, the table that you see is, is, is the, the trends that we are promoting. Uh, so I, I have mentioned the first QBD project, so more than 250 uh, runs at scale. And we'll be able to, we are now able to, to leverage this prior knowledge to minimize the experiments uh, done at large scale and, and support, support the filing of new drugs um, under QBD with minimum. And, and it, it, the number that you see, it's, it's an impressive reduction. So today we, we, are, we are supporting filings with less than or approximately uh, nine, nine trials at scale with, with the savings in material that, that you see in the screen and in time as well. So as conclusion, um, soon, soon presented in the first part of, of this webinar, uh, a very, a very uh, uh, an approach that that is the the best in terms of, of risk. So it's it's a, a design space that is built with product specific data at a given scale. So the uncertainty is minimum. The drawback is the costs for in the early stages of the of the development. Uh, on the second part of the webinar that, that I have presented, it was a, a model, model and risk-based approach that tries to leverage the, the prior knowledge and theoretical tools to, to, to minimize the, the resources and build a design space uh, at, at any scale. And this is, this is all from, from, from our side. Stephen. Thank you for that. Uh, once again, that was Dr. Anderson and Dr. Ficente. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. And once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question is, how many experiments are genuinely needed to obtain enough data for a design space and slash or sufficient for robust and filing. Uh, I believe that's for you, Dr. Anderson. Yes, but I, I think also that uh, Joao showed a very nice, the last slide that he showed basically shows that it can be done with very few experiments. And Joao showing the base that nine experiments has been quite a development, quite impressive. And I think it really depends on what kind of you know, also the company strategy and also with the QA and regulatory what 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 is comfortable and what what's really for the specific company what is comfortable for them to basically say that you have robustness. So I would say nine. I, I can say from my own personal. Uh, you can say feeling. I would say nine is probably a little bit low for me in order to really say that it's robust. But I would definitely agree that we don't need 40, for example. It might be, let's say, 20. So, it, but it's dependent also on the risk. I mean, how how basically also the data you have to support basically the whole um, spray drying process, also the kind of experience you have with the, with that process. Thank you. Our next question is: uh, How accurate are the models mentioned? I believe that's for you, Dr. Facente. So the models we I have I have presented different different models so that there are different different uh, layers of modeling. So for example, uh, the the thermodynamic model that that is very very accurate. So 
I, I expect that uh, the mass and internet balance of, 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 of a given spread rider uh, will not will not fail for more than five for five degrees Celsius, for example, in, in the temperature. So this is a very reliable and accurate model. Then that the optimization model that that is that there are different different optimization it is optimization models. Um, I think one, one 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 thing that I can I can add um, is, for example, when when I, I have data from the lab and one or at, at least one one batch at at the at the manufacturing scale, uh, maybe a pilot or any 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 scale, the the accuracy for for the the scale up for for another uh, third scale, uh, either for size for particle size and density. Uh, is is can consider 25 percent of, of the error. So imagine a particle size of 20 microns. I would say that the the extrapolation of of the scale independent correlation will be 20 plus minus five. So 25 percent of, of the target value will be will, will, will give it a good idea. Um, then the, the line kinetics model. That then mean that, that I, I don't have a. a uh, an exact number to, to provide the accuracy of, of that. But for example, we we calculate the, the spray length of every batch. So the the max or other words or the words that I, I used during the webinar, the maximum drop droplet size that can be dried in a given scale, uh, and and I have 100 percent 100 percent positives uh, in, in that. So all all the the 1,500 batches that were dried and then that, that are in the database uh, have a, a, a droplet size below the maximum. Um, so can, I don't have an accuracy, but I, I have demonstrated that the that can be used to predict. Uh, Thank you. Our next question is, what kind of savings, API and time, is it possible to gain from full application of QBD? Uh, how much will PAT contribute slash add? I believe that's for you soon. Yes, and that's um, definitely a fair question because as we saw in some of the estimates that also as you are also showed with the data behind with the batches, I mean, there definitely is some significant savings to, to be achieved by implementing it, but also as we stated, I mean, it does cost a lot more in the beginning and simply to achieve the understanding of the product and also of the process. So for the case study I showed, we basically were able, basically all the costs we put into the three DOEs, we saved those within, I would say, two years' time. We had saved those. So that when that, in that, for that specific case study, payback was something like 10 batches, and then we had saved uh, all the money we we basically used for the uh, for, for for doing the trials, but as also stated, basically shown in the graph, it will vary depending on the product. But somewhere, put let's say between ten to thirty batches. And respect then to applying the PAT, that one is definitely a little bit more tricky to say how much it actually impacts the savings of the uh, approach, because there's no doubt that basically you have a more information about the process, what goes on if you have the PAT implemented. But I would say we've also seen that sometimes it's not a must-have initially. It's something definitely to build in in the long run. But then we've also seen some processes where it does really pay off to have it because then we know immediately if there's some changes that's happening. So that one, is, it's difficult to quantify, but it's definitely from the process control point of view, it's definitely a huge advantage to have the PAT tools installed. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for just one more quick question. Uh, Dr. Vicente, this one's for you. Using a model-based approach, how much time in the lab and API requirements is needed to develop the process, and how much time in production and API requirements is needed to qualify the process? Okay. Uh, so for, for the laboratory experiments, so what, what, what I, I would recommend is, is, is it is to run a, a DOE, uh, and so straight to, to the point. To the point, I, I would say 100 grams will, will be will be enough to develop the process in the lab and stability studies that, that I have suggested. Uh, 
in this presentation. Um, then for the large the large scale, then, then that will de depend on the verification that 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 we want to. So as I mentioned, the clinical supplies. So all the scale ups can be done without without a single experiment. Um, so for for that part, it's zero. It's none. Uh, then for the verification of the design space, that that depends on on the level of verification that that uh, we want we we want to uh, verify. So in, in in for the nine that nine experiments that I have mentioned in in, in the last slide, uh, that that can be done uh, in one week, and the size depends on, on the scale. So that one kg in PST one can be 20 kgs. That depends on the scale. I don't have a, a, a clear number for, for the requirements in terms of materials. Thank you for your answers and thank you audience members for your questions. Um, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters and that's once more Soon Clint Anderson at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson and Zhao Vicente senior scientist and particle engineering team leader at Hovian for sharing their knowledge with us. I would also like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at stephen edwards at biopharma-asia.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.